Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Hosokawa's webinar on the dangers of inaccurate particle size analysis. My name is Greg Boyer, and I'm the marketing manager for Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation and you find it informative and enjoyable. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them throughout the presentation. We'll answer as many as possible throughout the presentation or answer the questions as the presentation concludes. This is going to be an interactive webinar. Uh, we're going to be asking for comments and answers throughout the presentation, so we hope you can participate. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Leah Campbell, our laboratory equipment specialist at Hosokawa. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. During today's presentation, we will be discussing the dangers of inaccurate particle size. Um, we will be discussing these using examples from different applications and different industries, the importance of an accurate particle size analysis, the different particle size methods and techniques that can be used to achieve an accurate particle size analysis, and the main technique we will be focusing on during today's webinar is pneumatic sieving. We will be discussing the operating principles for a sieve analyzer, as well as the benefits, benefits and limitations of sieving. All right, so first discussion question, uh, what are some of the dangers of inaccurate particle size analysis? So if you noticed on your screen towards the right-hand side, you'll have an option to submit answers using a question or a chat panel. So please go ahead and tell us what do you think are some of the dangers of inaccurate particle size analysis? And we'll give you a moment to answer the question. And remember, um, it's not necessarily just physical dangers. There's also efficiency dangers, production dangers, economic dangers um, that can affect the overall product and actually the manufacturing company itself. Okay, so we'll take our first comment here. Um, Tim says, effects on the rest of process and overall end product. Yes, Tim, that's very good. Um, your end product does determine, especially if you're using a dry powder, it is determined based on the inaccurate particle size. And as we go through this webinar, we will actually talk about pharmaceuticals and how the, act, um, the particle size of the pharmaceutical does affect the overall end result. Okay. Um, Will says, inaccurate feedback to production. That's correct. Um, throughout, I know we at Hosokawa here, we always test for particle size as we're milling and grinding our material to make sure that we are getting to the correct specifications for the customer or what people are looking for. Okay. Um, Alan says, blend uniformity. Yes. Um, again, going back to pharmaceuticals, you need that accurate uniform particle size in order to get the proper dosage, which we will talk further on in this webinar about, but that does affect the overall particle size. Uh, Christina says, color or appearance of the material, like in cosmetics. Yep. For us ladies in the industry, you know, when you put on makeup, you want it to be a smooth, um, glow-like finish. And if it's not accurate particle size or inaccurate particle size, uneven particle sizes, you're not going to get that glow-like finish. Okay. And we'll take one more here. This is coming from Lee. She says, create more dust than attended. Yes, Lee, that's good. And actually, you're going to branch us right into the webinar itself. Um, most of you don't probably do know that dust is a byproduct of many industries and it does have very dangerous effects. Okay. And Terry here um, says, what do you mean by particle size? This can be very different than particle size distribution. Um, so particle size is the size of the material that you're using. Particle size distribution is the distribution of this. It's a size range of set particles in your material. So we can continue actually, particle size distribution is designed to determine and report information about the size and range of set particles represented in a material. The particle size distribution determination has been used to monitor, control, and investigate material properties in countless of industries. Measuring particle size distribution and understanding how they affect your products and processes can be critical to the success of many manufacturing companies. Knowledge of particle size and size distribution of a powder is a prerequisite for most production and processing operations. Well, let me rephrase that. Knowledge of particle sizes and the size distribution of a powder should be a prerequisite for most production and processing operations. However, I've been working in the powder industry for the past five years, and I've seen firsthand how many companies or managers and your machine operators, they don't know the particle size 
of their material and they don't know how to test for it. Particle size and size distribution has a significant effect on the mechanical strength, performance, efficiency, and ec economical properties of the finished product. Significant physical dangers and production losses can be incurred if the particle size and size distribution of powders being used in a process are not adequately controlled. Again, we all know dust. It's very annoyingly adheres to your TV, your tabletops. People are constantly dusting in their house. But again, as mentioned earlier in the webinar, dust is a byproduct of many industries and it can be a deadly, deadly material. Uh, for example, you're an operator and you're grinding a toxic material. You have your personal protective equipment on and this equipment includes a dust mask. And this dust mask filters 99% of 0.3 microns or larger. Without realizing it, you start to overgrind your material to 0.1 microns. Without analyzing your material, you have no knowledge that you're overgrinding to 0.1 microns. And now the dust mask that you're wearing that supposedly prevents you from 99% of 0.3 microns and higher is no longer protecting you. You're now inhaling these toxic materials, and this can cause for potential long-term health issues, and in some cases, death. Another physical danger is explosivity. We all know the smaller the particle size, the greater the surface area. And with some materials, this means the greater the surface area, the more explosive it can be. The equipment or systems that you use in your factory, while it may be able to handle the finer particles, it might not be designed to handle the explosivity of the finer particles. So if you begin to overgrind or overmill your product and you do not analyze that particle size in the material, or you are analyzing it and you're getting an incorrect um, particle size result, given the right environment and the right conditions, these materials have the potential to explode, causing catastrophic damage to the equipment itself, the facility. Um, it can cause major injuries to the operators and in some cases, it can even lead to death. You can see here on your screen in front of you, um, the risk of dust explosions exists in a wide range of industries. You have agriculture, um, paper or pulp, furniture, plastics, textiles, dyes, metal processing. So it really is, it's a broad range and it has the potential to do a lot of damage. Again, talking about pharmaceuticals and inaccurate particle size. Um, if pharmaceuticals are not used as intended, the results can be really damaging. Particle size is one of the many critical in instruments and elements in making sure all pharmaceuticals perform up to par. Having an inaccurate particle size in a pharmaceutical can have a major effect on the dissolution rate of the drug. So right now, I don't know if any of you guys know, we're a week out to summer. Um, I have severe allergies. I take allergy medication. And if I'm prescribed this allergy medication to take orally and the particle size is too large in it, my body might not absorb the medication in a timely manner. And again, if the particle size is too small in size, it may absorb it too quick. And I might not get the necessary medication that I need to prevent my allergies. So again, depending on the, upon the medication, um, the drug may need to be absorbed in the stomach. And again, if the particle size is too small, it might pass through my stomach and be absorbed in the lower intestines. And again, it's preventing me from re receiving the medication that I need. We can use the same example for orally or nasally inhaled drugs. For those who don't know, the material inside an inhaler is actually a powder. These manufacturers must ensure that the product is capable of penetrating the lungs. Larger particles, greater than 10 microns, are filtered in the nose or mouth. Particles between 5 and 10 microns generally reach the lower respiratory area. Particles 1 to 5 microns will reach the lungs. Out of a 200 microgram of albuterol, only about 20 to 40 micrograms reach the lung. The remaining drug is lost in the nose or mouth, in the device itself, or exhaled in the breath. An accurate particle size of the product decreases the effectiveness of the drug delivery. 
Particle size also plays a part in the pharmaceutical product dosage. The dosage of a particular drug may be altered if the particle size is too big or too small. Drugs that are compromised of powders or granules may clump together and alter the dosage inside the tablet or capsule. Again, these in those when you do have a dosage, you want it to be a uniform particle size. Improper dosage of certain drugs can result in severe reactions, um, health issues, and again, it can lead to death. Knowing and defining the particle size distribution in your product can have a huge effect on the quality of the product. Cement plays a key but often unnoticed role in our lives. Cement is mainly used as a binder in concrete, which is a basic material for all types of construction, including housing, roads, schools, hospitals, dams, and ports, and you know, in the building that you're sitting in right now listening to this webinar. As a rule, larger particles pack more poorly than smaller particles. Therefore, cement companies want smaller particles when laying cement. Again, the smaller the particle, we're increasing the surface area. And when we increase the surface area with cement, we're increasing um, the packing density. And this is going to eliminate any air pockets that can create a significant product flaw. Product Some of these product flaws can be major, such as a crack in the cement. You know, when you have kids or you were a kid, you never wanted to step on the crack because you didn't want to break your mother's back. But it can be as major as a crack, um, a cracker leak in an oil pipeline. And we've all witnessed firsthand what that can do to our environment, our wildlife, and, you know, even the, the people and around it. Inaccurate particle size can lead to dodgy cement, which is a major product flaw and potential safety issues for operators, pedestrians, and everyone, including wildlife in the surrounding area. The size of particles can have a direct correlation with the customer's perception of a product and therefore the manufacturing company. This is particularly true in the case of food products, which a particle size can impact the enjoyment of a product, like coffee, for example with which the particle size affects the flavors released in the brewing process. Another food example is sugar. Without sugar, there'd be no chocolate, no cakes, no cookies, and no diversion from the everyday afternoon meltdown, which should be kicking in any minute for some of us. Depending upon what sugar is being used for, the smaller the particle size, the faster the sugar dissolves, either in your mouth or in a dough mix. Small crystals feel smooth and dissolve quickly, while larger ones give a gritty or crunchy texture. And again, for us ladies in the industry, the use of micronized minerals in makeup products produces a luxurious, smooth, glow-like finish to the skin and enhances the feel and appearance of the product itself. Large cosmetics manufacturers depend on micronized and sometimes nanoparticle-sized ingredients to achieve the finest product quality and applied finishes. Particle size reduction is the first step in the feed manufacturing process. By increasing the amount of material exposed to the animal's digestive system, it ultimately leads to more complete digestion, thus a better feed efficiency. Animals such as cattle and sheep have a rather long, complex digestive tracts and require a less processed feed material. While pigs have a fairly short, simple digestive system, much like humans, and therefore benefit from a more highly processed feed. Should the feed consist of an inaccurate particle size, the animals will not receive the proper nutrients they require to gain weight and grow. In turn, the farmer's daily cost of operation is going to increase because, number one, they need to purchase additional feed so that they can feed the animal. And number two, the animals will reside on the farm for a longer period of time. At the end of the day, they're losing out on profit because of the in inefficient, inaccurate particle size in the feed. Significant production losses can be incurred due to high rejection rates if size and size distributions of powders being used in a process are not adequately controlled. Inaccurate particle size affects, can, uh, affects many different applications during the production process. Not only do you have the potential cost of over or under milling your material, but now that material is a waste and the manufacturer needs to spend more money on additional material, not to mention the extra maintenance and parts that obtain wear and tear when the mill is operated. 
as well as the additional cost for the operation of the mill itself or paying for the operators for the downtime that the mill is not being used. And again, going back to the physical dangers, drug inhalation, explosivity. If an employee gets hurt or sick on the job, there can be multiple lawsuits, hospital bills, paid time off. Um, there's an increase in daily costs to operations because now you have to replace that injured or sick person. For these, from these examples, we can see that inaccurate particle size can create a dangerous working condition for operators it can lead to out-of-spec production, and out-of-spec production and dangerous working conditions affects the safety, reliability, and the profitability of the company itself. So we're going to do our first poll question. From the characterizations listed below, which one is affected most by the particle size? A, or number one, I'm sorry, bulk properties. Number two, the processability. Number three, the stability. Number four, the appearance, or number five, the product performance. Please feel free to answer this, and then we will show you the results on the screen. Okay, we'll just give it another moment or so for everyone to answer. We got about 50% uh, voted so far. All right. So, as you guys can see, it's displayed in front of you. 15% of you said bulk properties, 19% said possibility, processability, 4% said stability, 0% said appearance, and 63% said product performance. And actually, this was a trick question. All of you are correct. All of these listed here on your screen in front of you plays a part, um, particle size plays a part in it. Knowing and controlling the particle size present in a material is important for every step of the process. This includes, but is not limited to, the control of incoming raw materials, the product processing and handling, and even the confirmation of the final product. Knowing the particle size of a product can and will improve the product quality, the production efficiency, and the overall safety, which is critical to the success of many manufacturing businesses. Knowing and defining the particle size in a material can increase the overall product quality and value. Industries rely on particle size analysis to produce accurate, reliable, repeatable results to save time, money, energy, and resources, thus improving the production efficiency. With improved production efficiency and increased product quality comes an overall safer environment. Knowing the particle size and the particle size distribution eliminates any hazardous health and safety issues that were discussed in the beginning of the webinar. And we're going to have our second poll question. Please um, feel, free, feel free to participate. The question is, what is the best technique for a particle size analysis? We have A, air jet sieving, B, laser diffraction, C, Sib shaker, or D, a super secret alien technology. And for those who answer super secret alien technology, please contact me so I can know a little bit more about it because I have no idea and I would love to learn more about it. Well, apparently some believe that's the right answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, about 75% of you have responded already. Thank you. Okay. So as you can see on your screen, 20% said air jet sieving, 52% said laser diffraction, 19% said sieve shaker, and 9%, you guys, the 9%, you guys are going to have to contact me about the super secret alien technology. So again, this is kind of a trick question. Um, while there's no exact answer or best method, it all depends on what you and your company are looking for to get out of this and what kind of material to get out of the um, analysis, I'm sorry, and what kind of material you're using. So like we at Haskawa, we cover a wide, wide range of materials processed by our mills. And these mills include air classified mills, hammer mills, pin mills, et cetera. Um, so we will always use an air jet sieve. Um, you know, 
we produce this air jet sieve. It's highly economical and easy to operate. Um, it has highly accurate, repeatable results. Um, but again, like, so laser diffraction, if you're using like a net, if you're trying to find the particle size and your size is extremely small, even to the nanoparticle size, like we would suggest using laser diffraction. Um, you know, sieve shaker technology, it, it, it depends on what your company and what your what you're looking to get out of your analysis. There's a vast array of analytical techniques and equipments to determine the particle size distribution. In selecting the analytical technique or the particle size equipment, you must clearly understand the target or scope you're about to measure and the purpose of the measurement. A 12 inch ruler is not a satisfactory tool for measuring mileage. Likewise, an instrument designed to measure particles in several hundred microns is unlikely to be of help in determining the particle size distribution of nanometer sized powders. Thoroughly examining the properties and the characteristics of the powder and the specifications of the analyzer, this is going to ensure that you're really using the right method that's suited to that target and your purpose of your measurement. In today's presentation, we will discuss the pneumatic sieving technology and how it analyzes particle size distribution in a material. The Hasakawa Micro Air Jet Sieve model MIJSX is a highly accurate and reliable particle size analyzer. It's used primarily for analyzing dry powders between 4,750 microns to 5 microns by means of the pneumatic sieving principle. As you can see here displayed on the screen, the pneumatic sieving principle is when a positive airflow is introduced upward through the rotating wand located beneath the sieve screen. You can see that here by the blue arrows on your screen. As the wand rotates, it's going to disperse and distribute the material across the sieve screen. So 100%. So to our third poll question, what are the four most important operating parameters? Humidity, time, screens, vacuum, size, time, pressure, integrity, or fire, earth, wind, or fire, earth, water, and air. I'm pretty sure that's a, um, a band, right? Hey, I'm not sure where we got that one from. Yeah. All right, well. Well, 0% of you, you, you know, yeah. This is not answering that last one, so you guys are correct. Okay, we're going to close the poll and show the results. So 47% of you said humidity, time, screens, and vacuum, while 53% said size, time, pressure, and integrity. Um, whoever answered humidity, time, screens, and vacuum, you guys were very close, but that's not the correct answer. Size, time, pressure, and integrity is. Humidity plays an important part, but it's not one of the four operational parameters in pneumatic sieving. The four operational parameters for accurate, reliable sieving analysis is the sample size, um, sieving time, sieving pressure, and integrity, sieve screen integrity. So sample size. When trying to produce repeatable results, you wanna make sure you're using the same sample size for each analysis. When performing the analysis on the Hasakawa Micro Air Jet Sieve, we suggest using sample sizes anywhere from 10 to 100 grams per cycle, product dependent. Product dependent meaning if your product is lighter in density, you're going to have a smaller sample size around 10 grams and vice versa. If your product is heavier in density, you will have a larger sample size. Sieving time. We at Hasakawa suggest a sieving time of 120 seconds or two minutes per test of screen analysis. Should be pointed out though, the longer sieving time can improve the recovery of a given particle size for a distribution. However, excess sieving can lead to particle degradation due to attrition. This can be especially pronounced for particles near the tail end of the distribution. The recommended sieving pressure is anywhere between eight to 16 inches of water. Again, these parameters are product dependent. Should you have a friable material, um, you might consider running the air jet sieve at a lower sieving pressure or for a shorter sieving time. This is going to cause less attrition. Using the same sample size, sieving time, and sieving pressure for each test sieve screen, 
per each analysis will yield comparable results. The fourth and most important operating parameter is the integrity of the tested screen. And yes, that is a piece of scotch tape covering a hole on a sieve screen. And no, that is not what you want your sieve screens to look like when trying to do a particle size analysis. The test sieve screens being used during the sieve analysis should not have any mars, dents, waves, or imperfection, as you can see here on the left side of your screen. Um, you want your sieve screens to look like the picture on the right. The only object that should come in contact with the wire mesh besides the product is the nylon brush that's provided with the MAJSX. When utilizing the pneumatic sieving principle and the Hasekawa micro air jet sieve, you always want to start with the finest test sieve screen first. When starting with the finest test sieve screen first, you're going to remove any fines from the product, eliminating any potential for agglomerations and cohesions, which can skew, skew your results. Okay, so we did have a question here. Do, does sieving time differ from sieve to sieve? We, if, if you were to send me a sample here in our lab and I were to run it, I would use the same sieving time every time because that's going to get you repeatable, reliable results. You always want to try to keep around the same sample time. You want to use the same sieving time and the same sieving pressure. That way you're going to, that's how you're going to, to get the most accurate results. Poll question number four. Why do you want to start with an air jet sieve analysis with the finest sieve screen first? Oh, A, it saves time when performing a test with multiple screens. B, removing the fine eliminates the potential for agglomerations to form and skew results. C, Removing the fine particles first reduces the cleanup time. D, you have no choice, the machine will break if you don't. Okay, we've got about half the results in. We'll wait till we get about 75% and we'll show the results again. So, 63% of you were listening to me on the prior slides. 20% of you, um, we don't use multiple sieve screens at a time. We only use one sieve screen first. And the cleanup time, what's nice about this machine is it um, keeps all the dust inside. So you don't, there's not really much cleanup to it. So we don't really have to reduce the cleanup time. And 9% of you, the machine will not break. <laughs> a frequently asked question we receive from our customers is, can results from the air jet sieve be compared to a shaking or oscillating analysis? The answer is no. When using the shaking or oscillating method, it's using multiple sieve screens at once, starting with the coarsest screen first. The coarsest screen first is placed on top, and then it ends with the finest screen, which is placed at the bottom. While this method can work for certain materials, it's not the most recommended method because of the fines being removed last. With the air jet sieve, the MAJSX, we work with one test sieve screen at a time, and we remove the five particles first. Again, this is to eliminate any potential for agglomerations or cohesion that can happen. And when that does happen, it, there is potential for you, for you to get inaccurate results. Uh, we saw a comment here that uh, a few of you had trouble seeing the video. Um, after the webinar concludes, we'll send you copies or links to these videos so you can see them yourself. Mm -hmm. The MAJSX is designed with an integrated analysis computer with touchscreen controls and user-friendly software with step-by-step -step instructions. The MAJSX can be operated in a basic or advanced mode with the optional use of the high efficiency cyclone, as you can see here on your screen. It is the object with the glass bottle at the end. Um, the high efficiency cyclone is will give you 98% product recovery of particles 10 microns and higher. So anything below 10 microns will pass through to the vacuum. The advantage with the MAJSX is that it's designed with a built-in simming timer and modulating pressure valve, both which are controlled and measured by the software that was uniquely designed for this device. The software also calculates the percent of sample that has passed or is retained on the test of screen, whichever the operator defines as the scope of the analysis. And this is like my favorite part of this 
um, software because it's eliminating the operator influence or any human errors that can happen and, you know, determining the sieving pressure and monitoring the sieving time and actually doing the calculations for you. It's giving you that accurate, re repeatable, reliable results that we at Hasakawa rely on and that you, you as a customer can rely on. It can communicate directly with a compatible electronic balance and it's a quiet, clean operation. In other words, there's no dust during the operation and the noise level is comparable to that of a household vacuum. Another feature of the MAJSX is that it can accommodate a 200 millimeter or a 203 millimeter diameter test tip screen. The benefits of the Hasakawa Micro Air Jet Sieve is that it's highly accurate, it has reproducible results, and it's quick and easy method. It can save you time, money, energy, and resources. Um, it increases production efficiency and that overall product quality. All right, so here's our next discussion question. What are some of the limitations of air jet sieving, and when will techniques, uh, when will this technique not work? So, um, you can please uh, use the question bar to suggest uh, your response. Okay, so for Michael, who said needle-like products, that is correct. Sometimes the material can be too strong, or you know, when when utilizing an air jet sieve, it's it's automatically assuming that the particles are round. So when you have elongated particle sizes, it might that might not be the best method for you. Um, we have from Nathaniel, high humidity might interfere with the results. That is correct. Um, when utilizing the air jet sieve, we at Hasakawa, we suggest only analyzing dry powders with two to 3% um, moisture content, anything like that. Um, when you're introducing more air into it and the humidity, it's going to cause for agglomerations. Yes, um, one sieve uh, per test for Allen. If you do, you know, if you have a protocol already in in line with your company, and you need to use more than one sieve screen at a time, then the air jet sieve is not the best technique for you. When the product is too fine, again, um, that's another good answer. If the material is too small, it's you know, we at Hasakawa we suggest using the air jet sieve from 4,750 microns down to 20 microns. And anything finer, we do offer a 5, 10, or 15 nickel edge sieve screen. But with those sieve screens, the opening is so fine. There's such a um, high maintenance to it that we necessarily don't always suggest using those screens. So when you have anything below like 5 microns, you know, air jet sieving is not the best technique for you. Um, while the pneumatic sieving principle is the most simplest and common technique, it does have some limitations. Again, as I believe uh, Eric was his name, sieve analysis assumes that all particles are round in shape and will pass through the square opening. For elongated and flat particles, a sieve analysis will not yield reliable results. Some powders can have hydroscopic or electrostatic tendencies, and this will pose as a significant, significant analytical difficulty, especially when it comes to those smaller sieve sizes. The types of samples that may need to be analyzed, um, you might have a material that may need to be analyzed in a wet state or in a slurry. Um, obviously, the air jet sieve is used for dry powders. That's not going to be a great technique for you. We at Hasakawa do offer a wet sieving device for applications that require this form of analysis. This is why it's so important to clearly understand your scope and um, the scope of what you're about to measurement or the purpose of your measurement or the target that you're trying to get to. Even though there is a vast array of analytical techniques and equipments to determine the particle size distribution, each technique will have its benefits and limitations. So this brings us to our next discussion question. Uh, what does particle size analysis determine for you and your company? Um, we're looking basically to know a little bit more about how your company is using particle size analysis. And please feel free to answer the question. Does now. your company 
you know, do, do you guys actually test for particle size analysis? Um, you know, again, we at Hoskawa, we um, do mill some material for customers. And when it comes off the mill, we need to, we need to make sure that it's at the desired size that the customer wants and that, you know, we're getting to the spe specifications that they're looking for. Um, again, it affects the overall product appearance and value. Tom said to maximize yield of the process and minimize production costs. Exactly. Going back to economical values, you know, if you're overgrinding your material, there, there goes the money out the window because you're wasting that material, the extra maintenance on the parts, um, and, and the downtime, the mill being down to change out those parts. Um, let's see. Product qualification and particle distribution and manufacturing yield. Well, that is correct. Again, these are all great examples of why you need to test for your particle size analysis. It allows us to adjust the process parameters to keep our product in specification for our, for our customers. Nathaniel, that's exactly what we do here as well. So, and then again, um, it affects product appearance and value, of course, as always, as we discussed um, with the makeup industry. Um, and then of course, uh, the, the improper dosage in the pharmaceuticals, it really does play a huge effect on the end product for many different industries. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation on the dangers of inaccurate particle size analysis. Again, knowing and controlling the particle size in the material will increase product quality, improve production efficiency, and the overall success of the company. With long life and minimal downtime, the MHSX is the economical and reliable solution to your particle size analysis needs. Thank you again. I'm going to pass back over to Greg for the question and answer part of the webinar. Thank you, Leo. Uh, we're going to take some questions now from anyone who would like to submit one using the question panel. Uh, we had almost 600 people participate, so the pile of questions is adding up. So we're going to do the best we can to answer as many of these as possible. However, if we're unable to answer your question live right now, Leah or someone from our lab department will contact you offline. All right, so first question is, uh, what is a recommended method for containment of hazardous material? So this is a really great question, especially considering the physical dangers we discussed earlier in the webinar. Um, provided your air jutsu is working properly, any powder or dust will be contained in the system. But before you even get to working the air jutsu, you want to make sure you're following your company's um, safety protocol. You want to make sure you're wearing all the necessary personal protective equipment. This includes, but is not limited to, your safety glasses, the gloves, the dust mask, and any type of lab jacket. Um, you can have your machine, you have the air jet sieve in a containment or glove box. You want to confirm that the vacuum that you're using does have a HEPA filter. And, you know, following your company's safety protocols and analyzing your material will prevent any of the physical dangers that were discussed in the beginning of the webinar. Okay. Um... Ginny asks, what method, what analysis method is the most accurate? So again, it all depends on what the target of your scope is and what you're looking for. As mentioned during the webinar, the analysis method is based on the material being analyzed. For sticky cohesive materials, you might want to consider wet sieving. Um, for nano sized materials, you might want to consider laser diffraction. Uh, for particles, again, between 4,750 microns to 20 microns, you know, air jet sieving might work best for you. Is this product suitable for use with an explosive powder? Um, Will, our machine is not designed for um, explosivity. So that's, again, one of the safety precautions that we talked about. So our machine's not. Um, I, can, I can email you personally to go further into detail with that. Okay, next one is, uh, is it possible to use more than one system at a time on the MAJSX? No, actually, you can kind of see on the slide in front of you, our, this AirJet sieve is designed for the test sieve screen to sit down inside the housing. 
So um, you wouldn't use more than one. You would just put the lid on top and sitting down inside the housing. And again, you would use the finest of screen first because you want to eliminate any cohesion or agglomerations that can occur. Okay. Uh, next question. What's the smallest particle size range you can handle? Again, we can handle um, down to 20 microns comfortably. Again, we do offer the 5, 10, and 15 um, nickel edge sieve screens. However, these sieve screens are more expensive and they require extra care and handling. So it would depend upon the material that you're using. And then we would give you our honest opinion whether we think uh, it would work well with the 5, 10, and 15 nickel edge screens. Uh, next question. What is the maximum? Um, from Diana, is there any way of hooking up this analyzer to a production side stream? Unfortunately, this analyzer does not get hooked up. You can have it right there next to your production line, and you can remove the sample right there and test it. Again, we suggest for 120 seconds, so it's only two minutes. However, we cannot connect it directly to your production line. Okay, next question. Uh, do you recommend any anti-statics? Um, we do. You can use an anti-static agent. You can spray it on the sieve cover lid. Um, just make sure you towel dry it before you place it uh, back on. Um, you can get this from your local grocery store or anywhere like that, and it will last you about three to four analysis. Do you from do you think that jet sieving can work more efficient than wet sieving? Again, this is all dependent on what you're doing. If you are working with the dry powder, I would suggest trying air jet sieving first. Um, however, it's all product dependent. Like if your material is really cohesive, you you might want to try entering it into a slurry. If your materials aren't in slurry, then you know wet sieving is the best for you. But if you're taking your dry powder and analyzing it on a wet sieve, you first have to introduce it to a wetting agent. And from there, after you do run it on the wet sieve, you then do have to dry the material. So it does take a little bit longer of a time. So if you don't need to use the wet sieve, I suggest using the dry sieve. Okay. Yeah, maybe it'll take a while. Just one more question here. Yeah. Uh, what is the maximum moisture content the sample can hold? When analyzing dry powder on the air jet sieve, um, as mentioned earlier in the webinar, we suggest anywhere to 2 to 3% moisture content. Anything higher will agglomerate and cause for inaccurate results. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Leah, for the presentation today. We are right at 45 minutes, so we do want to wrap it up here. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to continue submitting them here and we'll contact. You want to take one more? Yeah, I'll okay. take one more. All right. uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Greg. It's okay. um, Chris, is it better to report particle size in mesh size or micron units? This is totally up to you. Um, this is what your company preference is. Uh, we here at Hasekawa, we reference mesh and micron all the time and we do we do correlate back and back and forth between the two. So it, it comes down to what your company needs and what your company's looking for. Well, thank you, Leah. Um, like we said, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to continue submitting them here. And Leah or someone from our lab department will contact you offline. Uh, Leah's um, contact information is also posted here on the screen. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, the presentation has been recorded and will be posted to our website in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. If you've participated, you'll automatically receive a link to that video, and you can feel free to share that with any customers or any, um, any colleagues you may have. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, guys.